Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hopefully you had a good break after that uh, fascinating earlier panel. And uh, for those of you that I haven't seen yet, my name is Mike Parks, and uh, uh, I will be introducing our next uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Kim Young McClear, who is actually uh, a fellow at the Department of Homeland Security Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, and and I. You know, I'm very, very impressed and looking forward to uh, hearing this presentation and the uh, panel discussion, our fourth panel discussion on maritime resilience and cybersecurity. So, Doctor, can you uh, jump on here and confirm that we've got uh, in the house? Hi, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm here on the line and uh, looking forward to a wonderful panel. Well, well, great, Doctor. It's great, to, great to have you. And I, I just have to comment. I, I noticed uh, in your, you know, far too impressive bio that uh, one of the things that um, you've done is some work uh, on leveraging social media for large-scale disasters, and having personally in my my role now as uh, being involved in a Red Cross, I've actually deployed to places like Irma and Harvey and things like that. And uh, so we've actually, you know, been able to leverage your leveraging. So thank you for doing that. We uh, we spend a lot of time on that pl those platforms trying to help uh, clients in, in need. So really appreciate your work in that. And, and I will, the way we're gonna go about this doctor is, uh, unless you're doing it in the video already, uh, we will have you introduce your your panelists, and uh, if it's in the video, that's fine. But uh, and then once the video is shown and they've made their remarks, I will ask you to work with uh, Andrea, Andrea, and uh, or Katie, and kind of go through the Q and A, and you can handle that. Uh, I don't need to get in your way, but I'm uh, excited to hear w what you have to say and. Uh, um, the fact that you're, so I just want to make sure I understand, you're a fellow with DHS, but you're really uh, PCTS, Permanent Commission Teaching Staff at the Coast Guard Academy, is that correct? That, that is correct. I have many hats that I wear. <laughs> well, I was going to say, because uh, I remember being, being able to barely survive that electrical engine, you know, IEEE. Uh, just uh, and you, you've taken that to a whole new level by adding cybersecurity to that. So good for you. So with that, uh, Doctor, I will I will turn it over to you if you want to make any inter introductory remarks before we go into the, the into the video. Uh, th thank you so much, and I uh, just uh, want to extend my welcome to everyone who uh, is making the time to, to dial in, especially to, to this panel. Um, and uh, so uh, a big piece of this is, is pre-recorded, but I did want to just take a quick opportunity uh, to just, again, just welcome everybody and acknowledge all of the uh, the panelists uh, that are going to be presenting today. So I, I did have an introduction in the video, so I didn't want to be redundant, um, but I just wanted to, to log on in the live session and just say uh, thank you and Good afternoon. Um, I think everyone's going to be in for a real treat. Uh, maritime cybersecurity remains to be a, a challenge, and, and we really need to look at, um, you know, how can we get everyone on board from a variety of different disciplines. You know, the engineers aren't going to solve it by themselves. Policy folks are going to solve it by themselves. So, um, you know, please just uh, tune in to to hear what the panelists have to say, and looking forward to a very lively uh, Q and A following the panel. Welcome to the 11th Maritime Risk Symposium, which is primed to position well to discuss the emergent challenging and opportunities to mitigate threats and vulnerabilities in the maritime transportation system. My name is Kimberly O. McClear, and I'm one of the moderators this year. The panel in which I'm going to be moderating is Maritime Resilience and Cybersecurity, and I'm extremely pleased to introduce each of our three panelists. Our first panelist is Professor Kevin Jones, who is the Executive Dean of Science and Engineering at the University of Plymouth. Next, we have Dr. Jakruti Sahu, who is an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at South Carolina State University. And finally, we have Zach Staples, who is the Founder and CEO of Fathom 5. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentations.
Okay, thanks, Kim. As was mentioned, I'm Kevin Jones, and one of the hats I wear is the leader of the Maritime Cyber Threats Research Group at the University of Plymouth. And I have the fortune of going first so I can set the scene and say some of the obvious things that we all know anyway. First of all, maritime cyber threat is something that's sort of definitely growing and takes a lot of my attention these days. And we're now trying to look forward but as you know, in the classic court, predictions are very difficult, especially when it's about the future. So let's start by looking back a little bit. The world today is very different to what it was even a year back. Some of this is due directly to COVID and other global factors. But, but other things are just an acceleration of trends that we'd already seen starting over the past few years. And I think they give a good indication of where we can expect the sector to be going over the next few years. Go back just a few years, and cybersecurity in the maritime domain was barely discussed anywhere. And when it was, it was usually as a problem that might be worth paying attention to at some time in the future. It was low on people's sort of risk awareness and wasn't something that was really garnering a lot of research attention in the academic community. We then began to see the beginnings of awareness around the growing seriousness of the issue. Usually then a very IT show based perspective but already we were beginning to see the interconnectedness of systems and how effects in one part of the space would have serious consequences in other parts of the space. There was what I think we could call a genuine watershed event when the Maersk incident happened, because that made it very clear that there were real cyber consequences to companies operating in the maritime sector. Now, interestingly, of course, this was an incident that really had nothing whatsoever to do with ships or the maritime sector per se. This was collateral damage from an IT attack, the NotPetya virus, which caused IT-based systems on shore to be brought down, which then had consequences that really flowed out into the operational aspect of the sector with, as we all know by now, huge consequential losses with a sufficient number of zeros in the number that people began to take the whole idea of vulnerabilities in the cyberspace very seriously. Since then, we've seen many more sector-targeted threats, both shore-based and ship-based, although again with a preponderance of them being shore-based. We've seen figures reported in the industry like a 900% increase in the last three years. That's sort of quoted in a number of places. Now, to be fair, that's starting from a very low base, so the numbers are still small. But I think we'd all agree that that's definitely an alarming trend. Just recently, within the last week or two, we've seen attacks on the, the French shipping company CMA which indicate there's now a very clear business model, if you will, for attacking the maritime sector. And that basically means the trend will continue. Once there is an obvious model for making money out of attacks on a particular sector, you'll then see more and more people basically being involved in such incidents. We've seen in the academic sector, there are now toolkits being sold specifically to target the kind of vulnerabilities that are available in that space. So far, I think things are still generally IT based. So the maritime sector is really no worse off than most other sectors, and we're sharing common problems and common solutions. However, looking forward, we know that a lot of the operational technology in the sector was designed at a time when security, if it was considered at all, was considered an IT issue, and is certainly not robust in the face of a focused cyber attack aimed at known or recently discovered vulnerabilities within those sort of devices. In the, the current time, the global lockdown we're all experiencing because of COVID, we're seeing more and more of the world's business going fully online. And this has really shown the dependency we have, not just on information systems, but ironically on physical transport, particularly ocean-based transport, as we've seen sort of failures in the supply chain and shortage of vital commodities it's very clear that there isn't a lot of resilience throughout the entire supply chain. 
Um, we've also seen a great increase in creativity amongst malicious actors, with more and more incidents cropping up sort of across various sectors, including the maritime sector. Now, good practices and policies often inherited from the IT community, can mitigate the kind of low-level threats we've seen to date. And indeed, this is becoming common practice. And risk assessments, as most of us know, will be required from um, IMO regulation from the beginning of next year. It's worth pointing out that there are far fewer easy or off-the-shelf solutions available for maritime-specific technologies. And the emerging trend to focused attacks makes that a serious cause for concern. I think going forward, we're really going to see the need for sector-specific collaborative research that actually addresses the kind of technologies and practices that are specific to the industry. As an example and an excuse to talk about my own research, in my corner of the world, we're building a cyber ship lab, which allows us to recreate specific configurations of bridge-related equipment and networks, and to perform realistic threat analysis with sophisticated tools, including developing AI-based tools, in what is a hardware-accurate environment. Because we are seeing that sort of IT-based and simulation-based techniques really don't apply when you get to the kind of technology that you see actually deployed on ships in our sector. So we want a hardware accurate environment with high fidelity to the real world. And in our space, that's part of a larger cyber and maritime training ecosystem. I think we need more initiatives that are this specific for the sector so we can move into a regime where cybersecurity is as much a part of the infrastructure as resilience to, say, equipment failure is today. The sector is very good at surviving equipment failure, things like, for example, dual active systems on board a bridge. From a cyber point of view, those devices are identical, and a compromise of one device is a compromise of both. So there's need for a different approach to security as delivering resilience, as opposed to just classic practices for resilience. I think this will require significant culture change and openness to change across various actors in the sector, bringing in people like cybersecurity specialists who really have very little sector-specific knowledge, so it will be a mutual education going forward. I'll stop at that point since I think I've used up my time allocation, but I'd be happy to discuss any aspect of this either today or later with any people interested in developing some of these ideas. Thank you. Uh, once again, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Jagruti Sahu, and I'm an assistant professor at South Carolina State University. Uh, I'm really happy to share my research on Internet of Things and cybersecurity, and I will also discuss uh, some of the cyber threats in maritime IoT. So as we all know, IoT has uh, brought a major transformation in the way we interact with the physical world, whether it is motion sensor, temperature sensor, or GPS. So these uh, tiny IoT devices, they send their measurements over the internet so that end users can get a real-time update of the environment that is being sensed, or uh, the end users even can control these devices uh, from pretty much anywhere in the world. And uh, we have some technologies here, cloud computing, fog computing. So these technologies, uh, they actually satisfy the processing requirements of the IoT applications. So we have some delay sensitive applications. So, uh, so those applications can be executed on FOX servers. So in FOX computing, uh, FOX servers are the devices that are placed close to the end users so that we can reduce the latency. But we have some applications uh, that can tolerate the delay and that require uh, higher computational resources. So those applications can be hosted on a cloud server. Then today we have this uh, data analytics technology, and uh, using that technology, uh, uh, end users can have a better understanding of the data and can extract valuable insights uh, from the data just to make uh, some smart and better uh, decisions. Uh, 
So we have uh, many IoT domains, and over the years, so we have seen a tremendous growth uh, in the adoption of IoT technology in various domains, including smart cities, smart home. Uh, we have maritime IoT, then smart farming, and uh, smart transportation. So one of the things I'm doing in my research is to investigate the security issues in smart farming. So basically, uh, in a smart farm, we have a variety of sensors, from soil sensor, pH probes, to crop sensors. So those sensors are deployed on a farm, uh, and uh, they uh, so they are basically deployed to monitor the health of the farm. They collect different farm variables, and they send it to a Fox server, so we can see a figure uh, on the right. And these Fox servers can process the data and can generate uh, real-time alerts to the farmer, and uh, so these uh, critical alerts can be generated on conditions such as uh, if the soil uh, is low in moisture so that the farmer can take some action in time. Uh, but also we can run some analytics. Uh, we can uh, run some predictive analytics uh, to predict the crop quality, uh, to predict the amount of yield so that the farmer can make some uh, uh, smart and informed decisions on how to manage and distribute the crop. And also, uh, we can use some analytics to, uh, to, uh, to, to predict the optimal amount of agricultural resources, such as water, uh, uh, nutrients, pesticides. And in that way, uh, the, uh, the farmer can know how much uh, 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 those resources uh, the farmer can use. And in that way, uh, it results in higher agricultural yield, higher efficiency, and lower cost. Uh, but uh, this uh, smart farming or any IoT domain is no, no exception when it comes to cyber threats. So let's see uh, why these uh, IoT devices are so vulnerable. So one of the factors is static footprint. And uh, by static footprint, uh, we mean that uh, these IoT devices, they don't receive uh, updates as often as any, any other typical IT system. And another factor is high volume of data. And that makes it uh, 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 that makes this IoT devices uh, really attractive targets uh, 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 for this uh, for the attackers. So these data, high volume of data, it also includes sensitive and personal information. And then uh, another factor is uh, resource limitations of this IoT devices. So these are basically low power devices, and as a result, attackers can launch some energy depletion attacks uh, just trying to run out the batteries of these devices. Then another factor could be weak security protocols. And again, this is due to the low cost of the device. And, uh, and, and again, the resources are not just enough to implement complex security protocols. And last but not least, wireless transmission is broadcast uh, in nature. Anyone can bring a sniffer and can try to capture the data. So let us look at uh, some, of the type, uh, some of the cyber threats that exist uh, in smart farming. So on the right, we have a picture of man in the middle attack scenario where uh, an attacker is uh, capturing the data, but the attacker is also injecting false uh, farm data into the channel. And uh, as a consequence, so when we run predictive analytics, uh, it results in wrong recommendations for the farmer. And on the right, we have energy depletion scenario. In the first scenario, we have an attacker that is uh, sending jamming signals to the wireless channel. And uh, since the channel is blocked as a result of jamming, the IoT node will try to uh, get to the channel, and in that way, it remains active for a longer period of time. We have another energy depletion scenario on the bottom. So here uh, we have an attacker that is trying to hack uh, one application that is uh, probably running on the application server. And through the application, the attacker is sending malicious command to the IoT node to increase the sensing frequency. And as a result, the IoT node uh, will end up uh, spending more energy and it will eventually run out of its, its batteries. So how do we address those cyber threats? Uh, one solution could be moving target defense. So moving target defense works by changing the attack surface uh, dynamically across multiple system configuration. So the system configuration parameters could be uh, IP address, uh, ports, protocols, or encryption keys. So the goal here is to increase the uncertainty and complexity. Uh, and as a result, the attackers will be discouraged from studying the uh, system. 
So on the right, we can see a picture uh, how this IoT attack surface changes by using MTD technique. So at time t, we have this uh, system uh, parameters, uh, and they have values IP1, port 1, protocol 1, and key 1. Then at time t plus 1, we have an attacker that is trying to perform reconnaissance against the attack surface. Then at time t plus 2, the attacker is now ready to launch the attack, but the attack will fail and because uh, the system parameters have changed, the values have changed. But there is a key challenge here. How do we determine an optimal MTD strategy? And by optimal MTD strategy, we mean uh, which parameters we should randomize and how frequently we should randomize the, uh, the parameters and which MTD technique we should choose. So there are many ways we can change the parameters. For example, IP address. Either we can assign random IP addresses to uh, different IoT devices, or we can just rotate uh, the IP address among those IP, uh, among those IoT devices. So which MTD technique uh, will work uh, better for a given scenario? So it seems to be a decision problem, and we can solve this decision problem using reinforcement learning. So basically, in reinforcement learning, we have an agent that interacts with the environment, and it executes a certain action and gets a certain reward. So basically, the agent just tries to to execute actions in order to optimize the reward. So and and in that way, it it just improves its actions. And to design an RL agent for MTD, we have to model different parameters. So we have to model state, and we can consider system parameters to model the state, and we can consider parameters, frequency, and MTD technique to model the actions of the RL agent. And we can model the reward as a function of failed attacks or failed probes. Uh, but there is a problem with the traditional RL. So basically, traditional RL uses a table. Uh, you can see here there is a little table Q, that's called Q table. And uh, in case of uh, large state action space, we have higher memory requirement. And also we need to search the table looking for the Q value. And, and in that way, it increases the training time. So how do we solve it? So instead of using traditional RL, we can use a deep reinforcement learning in which the Q value is approximated by a deep neural network. So you can see the figure on the right. So at the input, uh, we have the states. And at the output, we have the actions where each action is associated with a Q value. So using deep reinforcement learning, we can have less memory requirement because uh, we no longer have to use a table. And uh, we can also reduce the training time. Now, this uh, moving target defense can be used for any IoT uh, domain. And uh, let's look at uh, different maritime IoT applications, and then I'll discuss some cyber threats uh, that can be addressed using MTD. So here we have uh, different IoT applications, search and rescue, safety, then vessel tracking. So all these IoT applications, uh, they use different IoT sensors, such as pressure sensor, gas sensor, vibration sensors, so to monitor uh, different parameters of the ship. For example, in case of container tracking applications, sensors such as humidity and temperature sensors, so they sense the internal condition of the container, and uh, we have GPS sensors uh, that provides the location of the container. So you can see here uh, the data that is uh, collected by the IoT sensors. The data can be processed on board uh, uh, by the help of our computing technology. We can have some analytics by having predictive uh, maintenance. We can assess the health of the ship so that uh, we can fix or repair a machine before it fails. And we can also have route optimization where optimized routes can be generated to ensure fuel efficiency and critical alerts can be generated on detecting any abnormal condition. And you can see here we have different uh, communication modes. So when a ship is close to the shore, it can communicate directly with the control center. But at deep sea or when there is no terrestrial coverage, satellite communication is used. And again, we can use cloud server for stories and for the analysis. Now, just like any other IoT domain, maritime IoT uh, is also subject to uh, different uh, cyber threats and vulnerabilities. So we have different cyber threats here, malware, ransomware, man-in-the-middle attack, jamming attack. 
And uh, I just have two scenarios here. So we have man, man in the middle scenario on the top right here. So as you can see, the attacker is trying to inject false engine data to the Fox server. And uh, when we run predictive analytics, uh, we get inaccurate results. As, uh, we have another scenario here uh, where the attacker is trying to send jamming signals to the channel. And since the channel is blocked, uh, the, all the engine data is lost. And because we don't have access to the engine data, it will increase uh, the maintenance time. Now, as far as the security mechanisms are concerned, uh, we have those traditional security me mechanisms. So we have firewall, DMZ, and access control. So those techniques can still be used, but we can use the moving target defense uh, just to increase the resiliency of the system. And MTD also complements the existing security measures. So we can also design MTD technique to address uh, these uh, cyber threats in maritime IoT. So this is pre pretty much of it for my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, then I'll be happy to answer. Well, Kimberly, thank you very much for the for the introduction and for inviting me to this panel. Um, thank you also to Siri for hosting this event. Uh, just to reiterate something one of my colleagues, Dr. Jones, had mentioned in his talk is that our mutual awareness of the criticality of maritime cybersecurity and its impacts on resilience is really just starting to come into the forefront of the discussion as we also consider maritime digitalization. And, uh, and so I think this, this panel and series willingness to host it and uh, Kim for moderating it uh, couldn't be more timely. Um, just to kind of build on some of the ideas of my fellow panelists, I, I really appreciated the way Dr. Jones um, gave us the history and pointed out the importance of this community of practice around maritime cybersecurity and the, and the direct and immediate impact we're going to see in the immediate future on that. Um, and also, Jagruti, for the deep technical dive on an application of reinforcement and machine learning to create a security infrastructure that would be applicable for the maritime domain. Um, here at Fathom 5, we focus a lot on implementation about taking the best ideas in maritime security and actually delivering those for our customers. So we are the onboard cybersecurity provider for one of the largest U.S. flag carriers, and uh, we work a lot with the United States Navy, and we work a lot with the public on defining what the art of the possible is in maritime cybersecurity. So um, in this short talk, we'll, we'll touch on all of that a little bit. And I think you'll see a thread, a digital thread, carried through what Dr. Jones and uh, Dr. Jaguri were talking about. The first point of emphasis, I think, that just naturally came up that I want to um, touch on in my topic was a point that Dr. Jones made. He, he said that generally uh, a lot of the attacks we see are IT-based. And I think that's true. But I want to bring up this slide. This is a maritime software landscape put together in 2020 that points out uh, all of the software vendors that are out there involved in maritime, maritime digitization, crew management, fleet management, et cetera. And if you look in there, there's a lot of software that is being brought to market that's at sea now on uh, – operational technology systems. So whereas we operational technologies were traditionally programmable logic controllers, motor controllers, perhaps um, human machine interfaces and historians with some amount of uh, field bus communications between them that move from serial over to ethernet. Um, we now look at how much technology and software is performing the sorts of vessel optimizations. And I realize this is an eye chart, it's not really meant for you to look up individual technologies as much as it is to show there are hundreds of software technologies afloat and at sea that are directly connected to operational technology. So there's an IT, OT bridge and fuel management, uh, route optimization, uh, crew scheduling, fleet scheduling, cargo scheduling, many of which are being run on board many of which are being run in the port, and again, almost all of which are being monitored or run directly at the shipping headquarters, all of those are running in traditional IT servers. So there's a real convergence that Kevin said is coming that might already be here, and that's the convergence of IT and OT. And I'll tell you, if you're building a ship, 
the way you make that ship, which is built by multiple vendors, work as a system of systems is you don't put any authentication between anything. So the ability to have a third-party software provider like anyone off of this map come on and deploy a technology onto your ship when the hardware that it's monitoring, and uh, Jaguri pointed out, the vibration sensors, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, flow sensors that feed these analytics, those are all built by someone else than the software integrator and provider. And the way they're able to get that data is that those data buses are relatively open, very little authentication. And so that creates this IT to OT crossover potential. It creates the vulnerability set that um, Dr. Jones is referring to, and it creates a mandate, I think, for all of us who are serious about securing the maritime transportation sector to start to be uh, analytic, detail-oriented, and driven about exactly what we're trying to achieve and security-minded from the start when we think about maritime digitization. Um, in my closing comments, I'll probably talk a little bit about how resilience kind of runs through this whole idea. But I want to just keep going on this, this theme. Um, one of the things that Fathom 5 does on behalf of uh, the U.S. Navy in an event called Hack the Machine and uh, at the largest hacker convention in the world called DEF CON, which is in Las Vegas every year, which was virtual this year, is run a maritime operational technologies hacking challenge. Um, we do this to get a gauge on the state of the art. Where is the maturity level of the operational technology, uh, public security, independent security research community? What are they able to do in a game format with strangers they just met over the weekend um, to show us what are the things that are theoretical risk and what are the things that are actual risk? We want to capitalize on the benefits that other critical infrastructure providers have derived from having an active uh, public open source security research community. And just, you know, take a look at this slide. This is a Twitter post um, of an electronic chart display information system in Ectus. Uh, every modern ocean-going vessel navigates off Ectus. They may have uh, paper chart backups. They may not. They're not a carriage requirement. Um, and in this particular case, on the operational technology bus that the Ectus is plugged into, this particular hacker has given an indication that this ship is doing almost Mach 1 at 462 knots. That's just one of many things now where situational awareness tools that mariners rely on, particularly rely on them in inclement weather and uh, in congested approaches, um, are vulnerable to the sorts of attacks that um, go well beyond spoofing attacks to the point where, as, as Dr. Jones again mentioned, there are things that could be done that would force a vessel owner or an operator or its charter or insurer to have to pay a healthy bounty. And as soon as there is a way to make money with the sort of nefarious activity, I, I, I am concerned, and I, I think rightfully so, we'll see this sort of activity increase. So what do we need to do to prevent that? We need to actually, as, as my colleagues have said, start doing the deep science. And we also need to start uh, building foundations for both lab and afloat testing. I think, I think Dr. Jones mentioned that they're working on laboratory systems for maritime cyber experimentation. Fathom 5 also builds one of those. Uh, one of the systems you see in the background there on that image on the left is uh, our GRACE maritime cyber test plan. Uh, we think Grace was Grace Hopper was instrumental at the onset of the computing age, and so we've named our maritime cyber test bed as an homage to her linkage to both uh, the maritime world and the computing world. And um, our test bed provides an opportunity for people to gamify ideas at low cost to prove that your um, operational technologies and their IT integrations in a lab environment might have vulnerabilities and allow you to test drive security um, so that you don't have to tie up a port a ship at the pier and and risk whatever operational you know, cash loss from that ship being involved in an experiment. So we provide a, a low-cost way to do that experimentation. On the image in the left, we've installed a mobile cyber range on board an underway vessel to provide a, uh, an RF and testing environment with a, another cyber range on the ship because we believe that there's fundamentally um, it's time to get started and it's time to start talking less about maritime cyber. There is a policy driver. I think everybody 
um, that's tuning into this webinar is probably familiar with the IMO 2020 requirements that will be coming out. And we think those are important. Those drive the conversation. The first year of those requirements, I think, as people have looked at them closely, can probably be met by starting to get policy documents in place, to establish the right roles and responsibilities, to create accountability for uh, security outcomes. Um, once that's done, the next thing is to start looking at the technology that would be required in order to implement this sort of uh, defense in depth, maybe even move in target defense, like um, Jagruti explained. But uh, we definitely think that there's a, a ripe opportunity to get started. We're happy to be part of the conversation in that. And uh, we'd love to continue that in the Q&A app this panel um, or, uh, or later on. And I might also add one more thread to this um, that uh, didn't necessarily have a prepared slide. It's a thought that I've been um, just kind of wrestling with for the last week or so is that, is that when we think about resilience, you know, it's in the title of this panel. I think there's really, there's two threads to resilience that probably need to be part of the discussion, the technology, the implementation strategies that matter. The first is that the maritime uh Resilience and cybersecurity matters for the fleet and the ports and the headquarters, you know, fleet management offices. And there's a there's a technology resilience to that. There's um, accurate implementation of network segmentation and some of the you know some of the things that are alluded to in the IMO 2020 and specifically in the BIMCO guidance and in the National Institute for Standards, the NIST documents about industrial control cybersecurity. They're they're technology driven. There's also this component of sector resilience. And since we're all watching this on a webcast because of COVID, you know, all of us are acutely aware of the dramatic way this global event has changed supply lines. And what that's going to do in our sector is make people vote for, uh, to create a more resilient set of shipping and infrastructure. Software optimization, um, digitalization is going to play a huge part in that. And while those of us interested in maritime cyber are, you know, are working with these CISOs and the, the cyber accountable individuals in these shipping companies and in the ports, on the other side of that coin, you've got the COO and the CEO of these shipping companies who are asking questions about how do I reduce costs? How do I compete in a more dynamic market? And the solutions that they're going to implement are, are going to have a strong software component to them. So the complexity and the amount of software that's directly tied to the operation of this sector writ large is going to explode in order to make the market sector more resilient. And so we've got to move very quickly as the community of practice in the cyber component of this to ensure that the architecture decisions for the implementation of that, those cybersecurity tools are right. And I'd love to answer some questions in the Q&A about current architectural structures we see for maritime deployments and ways we can just you know, make them better just starting tomorrow. Um, so the way those uh, things are going to get deployed and implemented matter, and then the way we think about the technology uh, matters. But we've got to acknowledge that more and faster maritime digitalization is coming. And as a community, it's uh, time to get ready for that. And um, love to turn it over uh, back to the moderator and to any questions you all might have. Uh, yeah. So uh, first off, I just want to say um, it was uh, it was better the second time. <laughs> I remember when we uh, recorded it live, but uh, but to actually you know sit and and, and really listen, uh, I really appreciate the second go around. So just again, just want to thank uh, Suri for hosting and to each of the three panelists, uh, uh, Zach Jacruti and uh, Professor Jones. Uh, your your comments. I really love just the diversity of thought that each of you brought. I thought all of your presentations really complimented one another. Um, and I know we have at least one question in the in the chat, and I see the note here. If folks have questions, you can either raise your hand or you can type in your questions into the chat. So I can kind of just kick things off with uh, one or two questions until maybe some folks uh, 
uh, chime in in the chat section or raise their hand. Um, so I alluded to it a second ago. I really love uh, diversity of thought, um, and um, many may not have picked up this from your your bios, but the three of you together uh, are really representing uh, quite a force, right? So we have the academia side, and your career you're at uh, in historically black college university. Many folks may not realize that. Um, Zach, you're you know representing a whole lot. Uh, as, a, as a veteran and also industry private sector. Uh, and then uh, Kevin, all the way in the UK, uh, also on the academia side, but there's also some overlap there with the physical labs, the research. Uh, so a question I have, uh, this is an, an open question for any of the panelists, is can you kind of just paint the picture a little bit on what does the future look like for collaboration? How can we better come together with academia, industry, government? Uh, where do you see opportunities and where do you see challenges specific to maritime cyber resilience. Happy to, to make a start on that. Um, the, the project that we've set up, the Cyber Ship Lab, is actually sponsored by government funding, has 18 partners from industry, government, and academia. And I think it's sort of just indicative that the problem in the maritime space is big. It's ships, it's people, it's infrastructure, it's ecosystems. And it's sort of probably too big to be tackled by any small group. So it's a kind of environment where collaboration is the only real way to make progress. And certainly sort of speaking from our point of view, we deliberately set up the project as a very open and collaborative project because the skill sets necessary are just broad and we want to make sure that we're addressing real world problems being slightly sort of cynical about academia, which I can do because I live in it, there is a tendency sometimes to say, that's an interesting problem, but an easier one for me to solve would be this, and that's what I'll focus on. And I think in this sector, there are real world problems, so we're gonna need that level of solution. Yeah, Kim, if I can just build on that a little bit, I think I think what they're doing at the University of Plymouth is really tackling some of the the deep systemic issues, and I think um, that's going to be kind of to uh, answer your question about kind of painting the holistic picture that that overview and those deep technical questions that are going to take many years to actually solve are great places for academia and government to make investment and put experts on the problem. But you've got, you know, you've got almost 100,000 vessels engaged in oceanic, you know, transoceanic commerce. And there are there are there are the next right thing that needs to get done tomorrow on every single one of those ships. And and you've got the owners and operators of those vessels and and their charter partners have got you know cargo to deliver next week and don't know anything about cyber and so there's an opportunity i think for folks like us to get out there right away and say okay the real answer is coming but here's the things you can do that are going to still be right tomorrow but you can do these things today and then we're going to try and have to figure out working with people like kevin what the what the tech transition is out of the government funded research in the labs like Siri and the University of Plymouth and to help those folks, you know, figuratively next week and next month. Hi, Dr. Kim. Uh, maybe I can add uh, a little more insights uh, uh, from the uh, perspective of HPCU, because as you mentioned, uh, I come from HPCU, our, our university, South Carolina State University is an HPCU. So uh, we have seen some interest uh, among our students as far as this cyber physical systems or IoT is concerned. Uh, so we offer uh, uh, cybersecurity concentration in our uh, BS uh, computer science curriculum. We do have a lab actually, uh, so that's called cyber physical lab. Uh, we have this uh, uh, really cool industrial control panels. So we teach our students how to identify the PLC vulnerabilities. And you know, we have this as Jack mentioned, IT OT system, Professor Kevin mentioned, and we show them how to implement uh, defense in depth strategies, firewall, DMZ, and uh, so stuff like that. Uh, but I think uh, 
it has to be done early on like we need more outreach at the k-12 level and also we need uh, more academia industry partnership so students uh, they need to engage in real you know hands-on experience uh, and uh, just to know uh, how to tackle things uh, in, in i mean in real world just to solve how to those uh, challenges uh, when it comes to real world problems uh, whether in the in the form of uh, as an intern or just to spend some time in industry yeah okay that's my thought thank you <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely and um i um had a very a warm warm introduction uh, by mike and uh so i i'm detailed at CISA, and one of the things i've uh, quickly observed is just how how big you know this problem set really is and you know we're talking about global issues domestic issues even things that span not just CISA, where i work now uh, beyond the Coast Guard. So you really have, even just on the federal level, how complex things can be in, in terms of managing uh, cybersecurity uh, threats and so forth. So um, so I, I guess there's, there's certainly a part of me uh, that, that's resonating with this concept of, you know, we've we've got to make sure that, you know, and I think Zach, you mentioned in your presentation, it's not just the technology resilience, it's also the sector resilience. And in my mind, I'm also thinking it's the workforce resilience, right? So to, to uh, Jakutu's point about, you know, the K through 12 and the outreach, you know, and sometimes, and, and I don't know, there could be folks on this call right now that are thinking, you know, what are these, you know, academia people talking about? But, but we also have to start thinking about, you know, our youth. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, Zach, you might have mentioned at DEF CON in, in your presentation. But I remember uh, in, in uh, DEF CON uh, last year in Vegas, uh, before it was a virtual, I remember meeting uh, a young woman, I think she was about 12 years old. And you got a standing ovation. She was talking about election security. And so there's 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 young folks out there who are doing amazing things. And I think we have to always uh, be creative in terms of how we frame this problem and recognizing kind of our demographic shift, which also includes just how people see the world, what motivates them, what inspires them. So how can we continually use research and these partnerships and all these relationships to really drive towards making sure that we have resilience across these critical sectors and critical infrastructure. Um, so again, just, just want to say that each of your presentations really complemented uh, each other and certainly that resonated with me because this is a massive, massive Massive, massive problem set and it impacts everybody whether we like it or not this impacts everybody uh, so I'm just looking uh, really quickly here in the chat section uh, I think we have a couple of questions so I'm gonna see if I can at least start from the uh, from the top here um, so we have a question from Robert Kraft um, and uh, feel free Robert if I uh, am butchering your question if you want to clarify uh, please let me know but the question reads does the panel see much traction with uh, a DevSecOps and IT and automated ops systems and will there be an increase in model-based systems engineering and digital twins uh, to investigate the cyber resilience across maritime systems of systems. I really love this question. <laughs> so uh, this is open to any of the panelists who want to take a stab at it. And this is coming from Robert Kraft. It's almost its own. That, that's a lot there, DevSecOps and the value of digital twins in the maritime sector, right? So I'll, I'll try and answer both of those and, and be brief and, and see what everybody else thinks. But first off, on the DevSecOps piece, I didn't cover it in my, in my recorded talk, but absolutely. I think when the, the, the push I see coming is that the, the use cases for optimization tools on board the vessel and monitoring tools and all of the reasons that, you know, that, that software landscape that I pointed out, um, very few of those are security tools. All of those are tools that somebody is selling to a COO of a shipping company that tells them it's going to save them money. And given the margins in this industry, people are clamoring for things that have the promise of saving them money, right? So fast forward that a little bit, all of those pieces that run on board almost all run on premises with some sort of hybrid cloud connection through the satellite. But since those, since that ship needs that capability all the way across the Pacific Ocean, connecting over that satellite is expensive for the duration of that. It has to have the capability to run standalone the vessel during some, some communications outage. So what does that mean? It means that there's going to be some on-prem uh, infrastructure aboard the vessel 
you're going to have software tools that are running there. And then invariably, there are bugs in those software tools. And so if we don't have a DevOps model for how you would deploy a fix a, to one of those bugs in that software, then we're going to have to accept leaving security vulnerabilities on board the vessel that are known by people who are on shore uh, who read that the CVE come out. The vessel just hasn't been updated yet. Right, so so the capability feature push is going to drive us to an insta date where we're going to need to have the DevSecOps ability to connect to the ship. Um, so uh, I, that is that's absolutely essential. And then the second piece of that that I'll, I'll be a little bit briefer on was the idea of the digital twin. I think the cyber physical test beds, like the one that I've got behind me, that help us um, understand the systems of systems risk, very similar to the one that uh, you know Kevin is also going to build at Plymouth, are absolutely essential. And the only caveat I would uh, caveat I would say about the digital twin concept in general is that the virtualization of the OT components in the shipboard systems of systems architecture. Is, is almost impossible to get right because the design set of features that, that let's say system A is your Ectus and system B is your autopilot. You can virtualize the way it's supposed to work, but, but cyber is really about finding the unintended functions that were left there by the developer. And if you don't have hardware in the loop testing and we're talking about mission critical systems, you're almost invariably going to miss the creative things that could have been done that the designer never intended. So the digital twin concept works pretty well for the physical models, like how does the turbine perform under the following conditions? The digital twin model begins to fall apart when you want to do cybersecurity research because it's the unintended features of the object, you know, features slash bugs of the thing that, that create the cyber landscape. So I think digital trends have a place in, in the features and functions of the thing, but, but less so and more the hardware in the loop type test beds for cybersecurity validation. Yeah, and if I could comment briefly on those. I mean, the, the first point I think is summed up very simply. You've increased complexity, you've increased the attack surface, you've reduced security. So there's a trade-off, as Zach just said, between basically looking at efficiency versus security. And that's a trade-off the sector's gonna to have to make. The second point, again, I think Zach summed it up quite well, but I'd say basically with any digital twin, you're testing to some level of abstraction. If you got the abstraction right, you get the answers that are meaningful. It is almost impossible to get the abstraction right, particularly if you look at an ecosystem that includes a port and a ship and a communication system. So you are having, again, to sacrifice fidelity. So it has a place, certainly as you scale the problem, but ultimately, unless you're looking at things at an electrical level, you are going to be getting a false sense of security, to be honest. So it has a place, but it has to be balanced. Definitely. Um, and so i uh, just going to keep on um, rolling through a couple more questions. Uh, and again, for the audience, uh, feel free. You can either hit the raise hand uh, icon or you can just type in your, uh, your questions into the chat section and we'll go ahead and, and get those um, addressed to the panel. Um, okay, so the next question comes from Andrew Tucci. Um, that name sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, so Andrew Tucci writes, can anyone comment on the need for holistic cyber physical human risk assessments to identify and prioritize vulnerabilities and maximize resilience? So this is open to anyone on the panel. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that because it's something we've actually spent quite a lot of time looking at. I mean, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the sector is it does have all the classic components of sort of cyber physical systems. It's very much driven by crews at various levels of training, ranging from sort of military crews that are highly trained through to people brought on board at the last port of call because you needed someone. And the other thing that's sort of unique about this sector is you take you a system and then you move it from New York to Shanghai and it's in a completely different environment. The whole sort of surface is different. So one of the things that we've paid a bit of attention to is classic risk assessment tends to be fairly static. You look at systems and make sort of a risk judgment in an environment that's often unconsciously sort of assumed. Whereas in the maritime sector, 
it's not just what you have, it's what you have, who's using it, where it is, what you're carrying, what sort of threat actor is interested in you. So it is very important to be able to sort of have a, a risk framework that's broad enough to cover all of that and can adjust dynamically for the environment you are in now for this mission. And I think, you know, the next question was about does this apply to insurer, insurers and vessel or fleet owners? It's something insurers are becoming very conscious of. Because, of course, if your vessel is carrying a cargo of grain to San Diego, that's a very different risk profile to if it's carrying a cargo of diamonds to sort of the Philippines. Same vessel, same technology but very different risk profiles. So I think perhaps more than any other industry, this idea of holistic and dynamic risk assessment is something that we're going to have to look at very seriously in this sort of this sector. Hey, Kevin, if I, I respond to the dynamic risk assessment thing, I think this is uh, going to be one of the hardest cultural problems for the industry to surmount because we're the industry is used to a static type certification. And, you know, you achieve type certification and you're good to go for a while until whatever, you know, the length of the period was. So they're used to a very, a very static assessment that's good for X number of, of years. Um, I completely agree with your opinion that the dynamic risk assessment is entirely applicable. I think it'll be a tough cultural change. It'll be something that'll be happy part of the discussion and that we'll be talking about. The only other thing I would add to the, the, um, physical human risk is that I have not seen, you know, COVID only reinforced this, right? Um, putting, wanting to put less crew on the ship in order to maintain um, crew spacing conditions. But I have not seen a desire for any shipping company to add another expert to the ship's crew. So I think one of the human components we're going to have to deal with when we think about the solution space is that we're probably not going to get a, a cybersecurity radio officer on board on board the crew. And so we're going to have to think about solutions that perform at an export level on behalf of the vessel that um, provide outputs to a crew that may have very limited specialized training in cybersecurity. I'd like to add a little bit on this uh, human factor side. Uh, we all know we are the weakest link in the security chain. And uh, you know that this uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, I mean, when we are on the wave, when we see the word COVID-19, we get uh, intrigued, right? We just want to know more and more about it. Uh, we are just so curious. We don't know anything, uh, I mean, much about it. So I think this training and awareness, uh, they play a critical role uh, when it comes to ensuring security of these systems. And you know what? I was just thinking, uh, you know, this uh, uh, due to this COVID-19 situation, we have this uh, new practice now. We all work from home. So this uh, number of home PC has increased uh, a lot, right? OK, so now the attackers, they have more, I mean, they have access to more computing power than before. So they can hack those uh, home PCs. And you know what? These home PCs, uh, they are really vulnerable, right? Right, compared to the workstations uh, that are typically managed by a team of security professionals. So they can hack these home PCs and create a botnet and use those botnets to hack uh, critical infrastructures. And all this is possible due to, the, due to this COVID-19 when we are facing serious threats in terms of health and economy. It has given attackers uh, they, these the benefits of, uh, of accessing uh, to this computing power. Yeah. That's uh, what I was wondering. <laughs> and we have the, all these human factors and this uh, cyber physical system. We have those HMI system. And uh, so that's why we really need to have a good like training program and awareness uh, just to ensure that employees uh, know the difference between a legitimate email and phishing email. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, absolutely. And um, just kind of a pulling the thread a little bit with uh, COVID-19. So I'm curious uh, for each of the panelists, um, this is open to anyone, um, in your perspective, do you think that COVID-19 has illuminated the, the need for any specific types of innovation? And if yes, um, what what are they and, and what are the implications for the maritime domain? Yeah, it's an interesting one. We. Uh, one of our customers has the fastest service from China to here. So they their business, unlike most people in, the, in shipping, has gone up 
because they're, they're the fastest route to get PPE from, from China to LA. So um, the uh, but what I've what I've seen is uh, I mentioned it earlier, but an increased desire to reduce crew size even more, even faster. I think there's been a there's been a there's been a steady march down in the number of people we put on a crew, and and there's a vision statement out there that you know that we'll have autonomous shipping. Um, that that's that's not an easy do, um, and, but but, it, but perhaps in our lifetimes, right? So I think I think what'll be interesting is every time you take a actively thinking working human off the ship, they're replaced by some level of automation. So I think the pandemic is going to put increased pressure to reduce crew sizes to be replaced by automation. And the question is whether the security community, the maritime security community, will be able to provide um, secure automation solutions that address that that desire to reduce crew size. Yeah, and I, I think I'd say I don't see any evidence of the need for reduction of innovation anywhere. It's <laughs> the same the same problems exist and new ones. So if anything, what it's done is opened new opportunities to think about innovative solutions, which might not have been cost effective in the old world. And things like sort of remote bridge crews are a good example of that. Um, but now, because people can't travel in the way they could before, then maybe for some applications that would now be economically viable. But that doesn't reduce the need for innovation, it actually increases it, if anything, I think. That, that, definitely, and I was also thinking about um I know sometimes from a response perspective, a lot of folks may design exercises around one type of an incident. So they may say, okay, you have a cyber incident, you know, what's your phone tree? You know, how are you going to respond? What are your response plans? And so I'm, I'm also interested in, you know, if this pandemic is kind of revealing, you know, what if you have multiple incidents, whether it's natural, man-made, or a combination occurring at once, you know, how is the maritime sector uh, impacted? And, and are we maybe seeing some different, um, you know, uh, perspectives, you know, in light of this pandemic that maybe weren't as apparent uh, prior to COVID-19? Uh, and I definitely agree, Kevin, that we, we can never stop innovating. Um, but, but kind of similar to the points we've made before about just the, the how many dimensions there are, right? And so even when we're looking at uh, crises, and we're factoring in all of these different disciplines that are needed to really come together across industry, government, academia, and so forth. Um, what's also our ability to even just respond? And and is this maybe challenging us to think radically differently? You know, in the olden days, people would say, "Oh gosh, that would never happen. That's far fetched, right?" Mm -hmm. And and as we've seen, you know, uh, recently, there, there's not a whole lot, you know, left to the imagination. And so, kind of just putting that out there into the space, and, and hopefully a couple of the uh, audience members may have a few questions about that as well. Uh, but moving on to the next question is by Mike Walsh. Uh, Mike writes, "How does the panel see vessel cybersecurity?" will apply to marine insurers and vessel or fleet owners. I know, uh, Kevin, you touched on that a bit, um, but uh, Zach or Jacruti, if you had any additional amplifying points for that question. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've seen this, right? So in a couple of weeks, I'm involved with a, with a different group um, that's uh, also London-based. Um, and there's really there's really two elements of this here. There's the BIMCO guidance, which is an insurance organization who's coming out and saying, hey, the collective guidance of the marine insurance community is that you need to do the following things. Um, what has not come out yet and, and really resolved yet is what the compliance regime is going to be. How are you going to say, got it, we did it, and a third party assessed it. So I think one of the things we'll see happening over the next few years is we're going to figure out how that compliance regime is going to, is going to come into being. There's the, the, the um, class societies are kind of stepping up and saying that they're going to do something along those lines. Here in the U.S., ABS has a team, you know, DMUGL has a team, Lloyd's Register is, is, is getting ready to do that as well. So the class societies, um, 
It's, it remains to be seen, I think, whether the class societies have the expertise on hand. You know, they have inspectors and they have relationship with shippers, so they're in a really good place um, from a business case to go do this. It remains to be seen whether they have the expertise to actually be good cybersecurity assessors or not, right? Uh, but so I think the one first thing we're going to see is that there's guidance. There, it's going to be reinforced by the IMO, um, and so we're going to have a compliance regime that comes into place. The second thing is that um, you're starting to see, and we've heard this from from several of our uh, you know, attorneys that represent various shipping companies, that when they're writing chartering agreements, particularly long-term chartering agreements, particularly for high-risk commodities like, like oil, um, that they're going to want clauses in the contract with the vessel owner that says that the vessel owner has implemented an effective cybersecurity program for the, for the vessel that they're about to contract to charter. So there's a contractual maturity here. And I expect to see that as the re compliance regime comes up, the contract is going to say something on the long lines of you have to have proven via compliance mechanism X that you meet you know, guidance Y. Right, that's all kind of a moving target right now. But give it, give it three or four years, and I, I think that's definitely going to be out there. Which, from our perspective, unfortunately, is a lot of paperwork shuffling. So I'm not convinced that that compliance contract insurance like like Tango is actually going to make a big difference. So we're kind of plodding right along here, saying, okay, when you finally get to the list of things you're going to do. There are some things that make sense about how you do cost-effective prototyping for your ships to make sure that the – and start to do some things from a technical perspective so that your your ships are less vulnerable. And particularly, you know, of, of concern to me now is the ability for an IT-level problem in the port – or in the business system of the shipper, right? That's the not pet you example that, that Kevin led with. Um, bleed over to impact um, systems actually on the vessel. There's some network segmentation and some firewalling and some communications architecture things that need to be done in the very near term just to put a pin in that one and say, okay, that's not going to work. Zach, this is Mike Walsh. Thank you for answering that. And thank you, Kevin, for your earlier comments. Uh, a few things. One is specifically is when talking about the IT and the OT, you've hit a few very key points, and that is uh, bandwidth replication and monitoring from ashore to a vessel underway. The bandwidth is not substantial. Number two, on the digital twinning and the DevSecOps type approach, when uh, and I've pulled this apart uh, previously with a bunch of other folks. Um, there's a tremendous amount of legacy equipment that's there that cannot be just replaced in order to be built into that uh, security framework or an RMF, if, if we will. Um, the IMO, which brings the compliance to bear, uh, which is being targeted for sharing um, underneath a voluntary program, uh, sort of wraps that together. That does go directly with uh, not just the class societies, but also the chartering agreements. Most of them don't have the money for that. Um, on the digital twinning side, uh, Kevin, is uh, the legacy equipment that's out there. You know, when we talk about OT, um, it just is not viable in that type of an environment for much of this, uh, much of these systems. The IoT is in fact gaining speed and momentum. My question around the compliance and the insurance uh, visibility to it is, you know, obviously everything is money driven, including the transportation itself, the goods, the shipments, 90% of our goods go across the water. We know that. Um, but what is the feedback coming from the insurance companies today? And how are we as a nation being able to tighten that up on our own accord as opposed to waiting for it, waiting for the IMO? So a lot of variables there. It's not an easy solvable problem. And, and thank you for the, the panel discussion. Yes, yeah, so just a quick comment on that if I can. I mean, we're working with a number of insurance clubs and class societies. And I think what they're realizing is, you know, if you look at classic insurance, you have a large actuarial database that you can base, you can use as a basis for risk assessment. In the cyber aspect of maritime, we don't have that kind of information. So people are still taking fairly wild guesses at the effective insurance levels. 
And I think over the next few years, we're going to see growing information as sort of certs and so on share more information. And I think, you know, it'll come back, as you said, to money. Eventually, people will realize what's the right level of mitigation and understanding to set the right level of cost in the insurance space. And there'll be some sort of balance between writing off the risk by assigning it to an insurance company versus spending the money to protect yourself. And eventually, that will be based on information rather than where we currently are, which is basically people doing whatever seems obvious at the time. And somebody will get burnt by that at some point. Thank you. I'm just uh, scrolling through with the questions. We have uh, quite a few that just uh, dropped in, so I'm just going to keep uh, keep moving. This, this next question is from Dr. Joe Dorenzo, um, and this question is for Kevin. Um, and so um, he says, uh, thank you for joining, of course. And he says, this question is simple. Tripwire published a piece last month on the importance of being cyber resilience. What is the single most important thing shipbuilders need to ensure that highlight the critical nature of maritime cyber resilience from both the machine and human perspective? Okay. Thanks, John. Delighted to be here. It would have been more fun to be in Chicago than sitting in my home office talking to you, but we take what we can get. Um, I think there's a simple answer to that, actually. It's proper understanding of the risk. Because I think at the moment we're seeing what you see classically in a kind of emerging sector. There are a bunch of people offering expertise. Some of them are experts and others are experts in something else. The classic example of people selling you know, firewall systems for onboard ship systems where most of the vulnerabilities are not classic network based. So I think if you really had a proper understanding of the risk that you are in in your space and then mitigated appropriately so you've got genuinely cost effective solution, some of that mitigation is training crew. Some of that mitigation is closing a particular port. Some of that mitigation is upgrading one device. So, you know, the single thing is an understanding of the risk you are currently assuming. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin, for that. Uh, the next question comes from Gary Kessler, who writes, I often use the quote, those who think that technology can solve their problems don't understand te technology or their problems. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> could, <Jeff. laughs> could, could the panel talk about non-technical aspects of changing the industry's viewpoint to even recognize the problem? That's coming from Gary Kessler. There's an addition to that quote, which is usually involving people. If you think technology can understand your problems, you don't understand technology or the problems, you really don't understand people. And I think, you know, the, the implication of that is quite right. This is not a technological problem in this sector. It's much bigger than that. And so a lot of it is education. Some of it will require regulation because there are people who will not move until forced to. So I think going back to something that was said earlier on by pretty much everyone, this has to be a holistic approach sort of people, technology, regulation, government, all of it needs to come together. And that will probably happen when there's a big enough disaster that people actually do something about it. We sort of thought that maybe Merck losing that amount of money might have been enough, but apparently not. Eventually, I think there will be something that will cause that level of, of interest to sort of permeate, and then we'll take it seriously. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's another approach here, and I think it's um, I think the the it's non-technical in a way, but it, it's convincing the people that are buying increased shipboard and port automation to demand that the the value they're requesting from that particular device come with decrease the tax service, and just knowing to ask that question. So the, there is a decent amount of money being invested in you know, maritime and port automation and optimization technologies. When they make that bid, they don't also ask that vendor and tell me how you're gonna reduce my cyber attack service. So I think, I think that's important. And then just the one thing I would suggest about you know, what do ship builders need to do right now? The um, cargo data, so the, you know, whatever your cargo monitoring system, whether it's, it's, it's reefers or it's bulk cargo or it's liquid cargo, um, 
car, the data about cargo monitoring, the data about the engineering propulsion plant operation, and the data about the ship's navigation system, and then the communications IT network on the ship need to be segregated on different networks. Now, they could, you can use a host of different technologies to implement that segregation. But the number one thing, if you're going to build a new ship today, you need to do is implement um, a segmentation scheme for the way those data elements are shared, and then have a brokering system that makes whitelisted decisions about who gets to talk across those boundaries. I think uh, uh, I think uh, we need to have uh, all stakeholders uh, come together and discuss this uh, uh, different issues, whether it's for compliance and uh, regulatory issues. Uh, and we also need input of all stakeholders, whether it's academia, industry, government, or different federal agencies. And also, I think uh, we have some technical frameworks uh, by NISD, and we also have this nice framework uh, that that we can really use. I mean, employers can use it uh, when it comes to developing a, 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 I mean, an efficient workforce. So even when we design our curriculum, so we look at uh, that uh, nice framework and we make sure that we design our curriculum in line with uh, that specialty areas. But I think there is a real need to design a non-technical framework because this maritime system, I think it also uh, affects other areas of our lives. Uh, so I think there are some social uh, economic uh, factors. So we, I think there is a need to design such a framework, uh, taking inputs of all those stakeholders. I think so. Uh, uh, definitely, and, and all all great points. Um, and I know there's been some some comments in the uh, chat section here about uh, the uh, pipeline and kind of the the, the key to, uh, to to broader resilience. Um, circling back a little bit on maritime trends potentially exasperated by the pandemic. So this is coming again from Robert Kraft, who says, "What other existing trends within the maritime sector have been exasperated?" by the COVID-19 pandemic, if any. One of, one of the trends I see in kind of the maritime sector at large is increased port automation. There was, there was a lot of manual tasks in the port and in the, and in the ship loading and lots of person-to-person -person interactions that, that made that possible. You know, one of the things we've seen in the pandemic is people figuring out how to do that at a distance, whether it's um, so there's a lot more or less human to human interaction in the port. And I think what I, you know, one of the, one of the keys to automation is, is, is good documentation of exactly what's going on today. And I think, I think what we've seen in the pandemic is now people are very closely scrutinizing, well, who all exactly is working? What exactly all is critical? And I think that level of documentation is going to kind of set the base data set for the next round of automation. And so I, I think it's probably a lagging indicator. I think the, but the pandemic has created the data collection that nobody would have paid for in this very, very detailed way six months ago, nine months ago. Has it been nine months in the pandemic already? Yeah, I guess <laughs> almost. Yeah, and I think that there's been a tendency to look at different kind of optimizations because, I mean, certainly what we've seen in parts of the sector is there was the belief you could move crews around in a sort of reasonable manner. And mm -hmm. then various countries have been putting quarantines of various time periods or playing simply from there, you can't come in here. And that's really sort of messed up the overall kind of availability of skills. And I think a lot of companies have found they're more vulnerable to not having the right kind of skill set on the bridge than they realized they were. And the old model of, well, you can fill that by grabbing somebody from over there and bringing them here doesn't work so well. So even if you're not going as far as as sort of automating the crew out, you are realizing the optimization of who's where and when they get there. And there's a much greater latency in the pipeline. Has made people think about operational planning in a very different way, I think. Um, I'm not sure if COVID-19 has impacted uh, the operation of this transportation. I don't know if the traffic has increased uh, recently because all these countries, uh, they are increasing. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they are relying on other countries to send the medical supplies from China, Taiwan. They are sending supplies to, to the U.S. and other European countries. I'm not sure whether it has, uh, it has overwhelmed the operation of this uh, maritime sector or something like that. 
it may have contributed uh, to the to the way it operates. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, de definitely. And uh, just looking uh, at our time, I think we have uh, about nine minutes left, and I wanted to allot at least uh, the last two minutes for each of you to just kind of make uh, closing uh, comments for the audience. So it looks like we have about two more questions, uh, and then we'll just kind of uh, do, a, do a closing and a wrap-up. Um, so the next question is coming from Michael Trent, who says, uh, some comments were made regarding the increasing automation on ships and the continuing pressure to reduce crew size. Given that remote monitoring of vessels relies on radio communications that can be disrupted or lost for periods of time, how do we provide continuous cybersecurity on board without skilled crew to monitor operations? Yeah, and I think this is, this is again, almost a classic question of where does automation fit in the loop? Mm -hmm. Because I know certainly from a lot of our perspectives, we assume that ultimately you have somebody who can look out the window and say, hang on, this doesn't seem right. Well, you take that out of the loop and you're reliant on local systems to be able to make right decisions. I think it'll come back to any classic model of sort of resilience and knowing when to basically do nothing because you've lost communication that's necessary. You know, what are the kind of fail-safe mechanisms in that environment? I think it's actually quite an interesting research topic because at the current level of automation, the fail-safe is turn everything off, grab your sextant, look out the window, make it work. Take that away and you need a different approach to failing safe. And I think you find at the moment that isn't well understood across the sector. There are various different approaches that could be taken. So I think it's kind of an open topic, which makes it interesting. Yeah, I, d I just want to agree with that. I'm, every time I, I hear about the autonomous ship, I'm reminded I was at this, um, I was at a, at a conference in Silicon Valley hosted by NVIDIA about GPUs, and they had a poster session. And I ended up standing next to a poster with a researcher from the University of Alaska. And it was about, the, and there's this big poster about how autonomous cars are around the corner. And I asked him what he thought, and he said, "You show me an autonomous car that works, that finds a moose in the road in an ice storm, and you've got an autonomous car." And <laughs> build a toy that works in Southern California. <laughs> and I, and I kind of feel like th this about the autonomous shipping problem. There are so many regionalized implementations of the nautical rules of the road. There are so many challenges with bandwidth and what's going to be onboard versus offboard processing that, um, that, you know, with with a little bit of time left, this is going to be one of the fascinating things that we're going to get to see mature over the next 10 to 20 years, but it's not going to be next year. But I think uh, luckily we have these technologies, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, that can really help us monitor and control those EAP operations, those industrial control systems. So we can develop some autonomous uh, systems uh, just to make it completely autonomous. Yeah, I think so. And our um, uh, last formal question, and then I'll, I'll give the floor to each of you to make closing comments and we'll, uh, we'll get out of here. Uh, so this one is from unknown user. I'm pretty sure that's not a name, but, <laughs> uh, but, but I, I really, I really, uh, I saved this one for last. I really love this question. So uh, it says, it's a general observation that crime increases during a disaster. The discussion of cybersecurity during a disaster suggests that we ask about other disasters. How do we prepare for future disasters? Do different kinds of disasters make us more vulnerable to cyber attacks, or is cybersecurity preparation basically the same under any kind of disaster? So unknown user is Fred Roberts sort of on my system, so his obfuscation <laughs> is not quite good enough. <laughs> since I've started talking. Um, the, obviously, there are different kinds of disasters. In the particular case of the pandemic, we're looking at a people disaster because it's basically people's behavior and availability has been changed. If we had a tech disaster like losing power everywhere, cybersecurity probably wouldn't be as significant an issue in most cases. But I think, you know, ultimately it all comes down to understanding failure modes and understanding actions in failure modes. I mean, speaking as somebody who's been responsible for taking a moderate sized university entirely online in three days, the kind of resilience approaches you plan for 
and the ones you suddenly realize you need are often quite different. So I think I'd say we at least understand some of the vulnerabilities in the cyberspace. But my belief would be we're always good at finding new disasters that we never predicted before that we haven't prepared for. So I'm sure there'll be uh, ongoing dynamic adaptation and adjustment across the sector, no matter how well we plan. Perhaps that's overly cynical, but it is getting quite late in the evening for me, so I'm allowed to be. <laughs> I think it's about the planning, not the plan. So you plan for one thing, you learn how to be a good planning team, and then you end up using that team to solve a different problem. And that, I think that's, it. and the only other comment I would have there is that um, we're starting as a society, right? just look who all is on this panel without without traveling. We're starting to address this panel as a, a, this problem as an international system of systems, and there and there's some discussion about that. I think if organizations that that adapt themselves and systems that adapt themselves to large scale data driven decision making are in a really good position to kind of handle the curveball when it comes up. I think uh, I agree with both Professor Cavins and Mr. Jack. I think the best way to deal with uh, unknown disaster is to have this algorithmic approach, re reinforcement learning. We don't know what else the world is going to, uh, going to throw at us. So the best way is to learn from the, the environment we live in uh, currently, and then in future, uh, when we are going to face uh, something completely unknown, we have something that we can really use to tackle with that unknown disaster. Uh, absolutely, and um, I, I mentioned it earlier in a discussion about you know who who could have imagined, right? And I'm looking at a comment uh, by Duncan Cameron, uh, who writes that uh, they're coming in uh, into this uh, panel uh, uh, in the audience as an artist slash academic, so they're considering ways to creatively visualize the world of new maritime threats. And so uh, that comment uh, uh, definitely resonates because right, we're, we're talking about imagination, right? We're talking about can we imagine not just the problems, but can we imagine the solutions? And it really taps into our creativity and, and really just kind of hammering home the point that not every, um, there's no singular discipline that that's going to uh, to address it all, right? So we have to continually come together. So kind of just using that as a segue and to offer each of the panelists an opportunity to make closing comments. Um, please just take, uh, to look at the time, take about uh, 30 seconds to a minute uh, to just make closing comments. And um, as a favor to me and also to our audience members who are also students, if you can also just make any quick remarks to motivate students who maybe are not quite sure if they're interested in getting into this field, so what advice would you offer to them as you make your closing uh, comments? <laughs> I'll go first in this one since I went uh, last on the panels. I'll let somebody else go last. Um, but to the students, I got up yesterday doing uh, on a maritime cybersecurity project, and 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 all I could see was Puget Sound. If you're an IT cybersecurity guy, you're not going to get that opportunity. So uh, this career will take you to some of the most amazing, beautiful places in the world. It's an emerging career, um, and so I, I think that's what keeps it exciting. And uh, we're, at the, we're at the beginning of both this journey through artificial intelligence, how to apply automation and digitization in a secure way and uh, and work in this broad community of research, government, and corporations. So I, th I think it's just exciting. That's the message I like to share with students. Oh, I'll never get out of here. <laughs> And I think uh, either uh, Jakuti or Kevin, if you want to just take a 30 seconds to make a closing uh, statement. Oh, okay, maybe uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, so for uh, cybersecurity students, uh, I think I just want to say that uh, you need to be uh, be a little a bit creative, as Dr. Kim said. And, uh, you know, I know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, learning uh, theory is equally important as gaining hands-on skills, but we should know how to convert uh, the theoretical skills into practice and how to solve real-world problems. So we need uh, uh, to enhance our analytical skills and logical thinking 
thinking, those abilities you should work on. So given any problem, uh, you'll be able to solve it using your skills and knowledge uh, in cybersecurity. Yeah, and it's been a real pleasure interacting with uh, all of you and we had really great questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm assuming we're working in reverse order the way we presented. Um, I think that this is a great forum. I think the sort of the breadth of interest and the breadth of understanding is something is difficult to find in many other places. I think maritime cyber is a very interesting sector because it has some unique problems, which means it needs unique solutions. And actually it matters. You know, the amount of economic effect of the maritime sector failing is just astronomical. Um, speaking as somebody whose research group contains, as some of the people on the call know, everything from sort of, you know, full on crypto geeks right through psychologists, logistics people, artists, historians and creative writers. I think it is a field where almost anyone can make a significant contribution. And if you broaden it out beyond maritime to sort of cyber in general, but it is sort of a growing field where we need creative thinkers and we need people to solve real world problems that people care about. And to me, the best kind of academic problems are ones that are hard. You have some background to work in, require broad thinking so you can't solve them easily. And people actually care if you do. And I think all of those come together quite nicely in this sector. So it is a great opportunity. There are interesting technical problems. There are interesting practical problems. And we need lots of people, creative people, bright people, to kind of jump in and do something. So take it as a challenge. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, to each of the panelists, to Zach, to Jakuti, and to Kevin. Um, I had a blast and just looking at the comments section, I'm sure our audience had a great time as well. Um, so I'm going to hand it back off to Andrea at Surrey. Um, but thank you again for, for hosting and allowing us to have this panel.